Welcome, everybody, to Skeptics in the Pub online uh, tonight. Uh, I hope you're all uh, ready for a really interesting talk. We should have a fantastic uh, talk lined up. If this is your first time joining a Skeptics in the Pub online, uh, you're very welcome. We are an organization, uh, a, a collaboration between all the different skeptical groups around the country, pretty much. So ordinarily, in the before times, we'd be out in our local pubs uh, having these interesting talks in person where we can be within two meters of another human being, if you can remember what that was like. Uh, uh, and able to have these kind of communities uh, happening all around uh, in cities all across the country uh, for a, such a, for a, a huge amount of time, for, for almost a decade now or more, uh, we've been having these kind of events in lo loads of different cities. But obviously, given that we can't do that now because of COVID, uh, we all got together in actually April, the very start of April last year, to start uh, putting on events like this for free online, streamed to everybody as a, as a production of the skeptical community of the country. And this is actually our one year anniversary. I believe our first ever broadcast as Skeptics in the Pub Online uh, was, a, was a year ago tomorrow. And since then, pretty much every single week of the pandemic, we've been here bringing you uh, interesting talks and thought provoking uh, broadcasts uh, to give you that little slice of skepticism uh, to keep you uh, to keep you interested and keep you uh, fulfilled. And, and that's what we're going to be bringing you tonight. Um, so we're going to have a talk from our, our speaker uh, coming up shortly um, throughout the talk. Uh, feel free to chat on Twitch. If you're watching this on Twitch, um, feel free to have a chat in there. You can see there's all chat, I'm sure, going on right now. Um, we do have moderators in there. Um, so uh, if you do see anything you're not comfortable with, uh, the moderators will make it very apparent who they are and you can uh, let them know and we can make sure that uh, everything's all all right. Um, we also will be uh, having a QA and a after the talk. And you can uh, put your submit your questions for the Q&A uh, in advance if you go to SITP uh, forward slash on, sorry, SITP dot online forward slash ask, uh, which is where you can uh, ask our questions. And that link will be popping up in the uh, in the chat uh, periodically from our moderators to to point you in the right direction without me fumbling the URL. So that'll sort that right out. Um, similarly, if you like what you what we're doing and you want to help contribute to keep these events going, uh, you can go to SITP uh, dot online forward slash donate. And and there you can uh, send us just a, a little bit of money, a couple of quid here, uh, the price of a pint, just to keep these events going. And as I say, these events are happening every single week. Next week, uh, Thursday at 7 o'clock uh, UK time, uh, we've got Harry Cliff from CERN, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, particle physics in a talk titled uh, How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch, uh, referencing uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And it's going to be a really fascinating talk about particle physics, which we'd encourage you all to come along to. Um, so I think that's all the admin I need to get out of the way. So I'll introduce you to our speaker tonight. I'm really excited about the speaker uh, tonight. Uh, as somebody who works, uh, I work quite often uh, publishing uh, investigations in the media, and the work of Bellingcat is an absolute inspiration in terms of investigative journalism, doing the diligence to get to the bottom of the details and, uh, and corroborate uh, facts. And the work that uh, Bellingcat uh, do in terms of uh, open source information, using publicly available information to verify and corroborate uh, data and details uh, is absolutely phenomenal. They've had in incredible successes, uh, as we're going to hear about tonight, in, in cases like state assassinations, civil wars, the downings of, uh, of commercial aircraft. Uh, they've really gotten to the bottom of what really went on. And and so uh, I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from our speaker this evening. Please uh, fill the chat with clapping emojis for our speaker, Elliot Higgins. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Elliot Higgins, the founder of Bell & Cats. Um, I'm going to take you through today one of our biggest investigations in the recent years, um, the investigation into Russian assassinations. Um, I launched Bell & Cat in 2014 uh, as a progression of some blogging i had been doing for the previous two years using what's known as open source information, publicly available information, in particular information that's available online. Um, and the reason it's possible to do that now and not, say, 10 years ago is because of the rise of things like smartphone technology enabling us to show a massive amount of information through social media, access to things like satellite imagery and other information um, that the internet has made available to us. We were best known uh, in before 2018 for our work on the downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 in eastern Ukraine, where we showed that the missile launcher that shot it down actually came from Russia, along with many other details of the case. But 2018 led us into a new investigation, the investigation into uh, the, uh, the poisoning of Yulia and, and Sergei Skripal. Um, so um, uh, so um, Sergei Skripal was, uh, was a former um, Russian spy, former who, Russian defected spy who defected to the he was West. Being visited by he was being visited by his daughter Yulia in, uh, in uh, Salisbury. And, um, and his, um, his, 
we're at the they, home. We're at the and home. And they decided that they and would go to the local uh, ZZ Italian, Italian restaurant chain. Italian started restaurant chain. Unwell, started feeling and unwell. They went to a nearby park where they sat on a bench and eventually collapsed. And eventually collapsed by a And it was soon discovered. And it was soon discovered that they poisoned. Poisoned. Several months. Several months passed. A few months passed. Charlie Rowley, Charlie Rowley, discovered right here. Discovered a perfume box. Whilst he was diving. Whilst he was dumped diving. To his girlfriend. And gave all her girlfriend all sturges. She sprayed on her wrist, and, her wrist, and she shortly afterwards from she nerve agent exposure. From nerve agent and this is a uh, the box this is that was recovered. The box that was recovered. Um, this perfume bottle, um, this perfume bottle contained, the chemical, contained agent, no the chemical agent. Russian Nova develops chemical nerve agent. Um, and it had been discovered uh, in a sealed box, interestingly. This was not an open box, which indicated that there was possibly more than one of these boxes that was actually supplied to the poisoners. But we didn't really know much about these people until the UK authorities announced uh, they had two suspects, they had two photographs, and the names that they travelled under, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Boshirov. Um, at that point, Bellingcat, um, we weren't actually really looking into this. There wasn't too much we could um, find at that moment. Um, um, we had access to a whole range of information, both publicly available information, as well as a large number of leaked databases from Russia. In Russia, because of their incredibly corrupt bureaucracy, um, there is a huge amount of information that gets leaked every year um, in various forms. One form are databases, things like car registration databases, house registration databases for different parts of Russia that are being sold quite openly, both online, they're being shared on torrents. Even going back over a decade, there were kind of news reports you could read about Russian markets selling burnt DVDs with these databases on. And one of our colleagues, Christo Grozev, who was volunteering with us at the time, he had been collecting these databases, and we wanted to look into who these people were. Now, we have some details, of course, about the route they took, released by the UK authorities, um, that they had arrived uh, in Salisbury, spent a few hours there and then left. They're, they're heading towards the Scripples house. But that didn't tell us about who these people were, what their motivations were. So we wanted to find out as much as we could about these people. And the we use a whole range of different tools to look into them. So sort of adv- at the top of the list, we have things like advanced web searches, social media searches, uh, reverse searches on smartphone messaging apps. And Although we had the names, they weren't really bringing up any results whatsoever. They were kind of just mysterious figures who seemingly didn't even exist on the internet. There were more kind of advanced stuff as well. We could use kind of forensic uh, face analysis. We could search through government register. There were leaked email archives we could discover. The leaked offline databases that we discovered before and various subscription services to dig into them. And combining all these different sources, we were able to find out a lot more about what these people uh, were doing. But one of the things that actually was a major clue to us was um, a Russian news site managed to acquire the flight manifest of the flight they were on when they flew into London. And it contained lots of details about them. And we also acquired some data ourselves. And this is actually the booking data. And from the flight manifest we were able to, that was um, published, their passport numbers were published. But here we can actually see the moment they were booking their tickets. And one thing that stood out is if the first line where you see the online on the right hand side on both of these is both their tickets were booked on the 1st of March at two, uh, eight o'clock in the evening. And then they flew out um, the following um, kind of around midday the following day and arrived in London around two o'clock. And um, this is very odd because when they were interviewed by Russia today, they were implying that they were just tourists kind of on a long planned trip to Salisbury to visit the 123 meter spire. And they were nothing but sports nutrition salesmen. But the information that we were finding was pointing in another direction. So we had these details, we had their passport numbers. Now they were very unusual because their passport numbers were very similar. We could see they actually only were three numbers different, which is extremely suspicious when you have two separate individuals supposedly getting a passport. And that was kind of the first clue there was maybe something a bit shady going on here. So we were able to acquire this form. Now, in Russia, because there is such a massive amount of corruption throughout the entire bureaucracy, you know, if you're working in an office, you see the people above you corrupt, people below you corrupt, you'll also be corrupt because you see people getting away with it all the time. So in a whole range of government departments and different businesses, people sell access to information online very openly. You could go to like a Russian internet forum and find someone saying, oh, I have access to this various information. And what this is, is the passport registration form for one of the suspects. Uh, This um, form is very interesting. Uh, It's supposed to contain a whole range of different information. Um, First of all, um, you can see 
um, there's a clear match between the two individuals. So on the right hand side is the, inf- the photograph that was published by the British authorities on the left hand side, the person who was actually on this passport form that we ordered, because the first thing we had to establish is we order this passport form is it actually the same person. Now, you can look at some of the details here. We had kind of forensic facial recognition done, but even looking at this initially, we could see for matches like the mole on his chin, for example, his ear shape, for example, also matched and other details. We got one for the other suspect as well, his same passport form. And we could see, despite the uh, beard, that this is the same person. You can see details again, like the shape of his ears, you know, a strong match. And we also had facial recognition um, done on this. The really weird thing about these forms is they have a second page. And on this second page, it's supposed to have the details of their previous passports. And um, their passport documents for both these guys didn't have that on it, which was really, really strange. They're caught, apparently, they've both lost their passport, according to a mark on the form. But this was also a very strange thing. This stamp um, has a number on it. And if you Google that number, it gives you the contact number for the Russian Ministry of Defense. And that's a very unusual thing to have on anyone's passport form. So these kind of clues were pointing to these guys being a bit suspicious. We also got their full travel records because this is some of the other information that's available. And we could see that they've been flying all across Europe for a, a couple of years, you know, London, Paris, Amsterdam, even down to Tel Aviv in Israel. So we were wondering who these guys were saying sports nutrition that didn't even exist on the Internet. What actually gave our first clue was an event a few years earlier. There was an attempted coup in Montenegro where a large number of uh, um, operatives were actually arrested and found with a huge amount of equipment. And it was discovered they were planning a coup in Montenegro. And one of the guys who was arrested was arrested with two identity documents that were then published um, by the local media. And these identity documents are really interesting because although they are the same person photographed in each of these documents. Um, It's not actually the same identity because there's actually two separate identities. There's a similarity, as you can see, it's the same initials, the same first name. We can also see they have the same date of birth and the same place of birth. And that's very unusual. And one thing that was also quite strange is if you remember the numbers of the passports for the Scripple suspects, This guy also had a very similar passport number, only about 27 numbers different compared to the Scriffle suspects. So it actually seemed like there was a sequence of passports that were being used for fake identities. And we had some clues from this. So we could see in this fake identity that they had used the same first name, the same date of birth and the same place of birth. So we thought, well, maybe this works for these two guys who have been identified as the suspects in the Scripple case because we had some of their passport details already. So we started looking into the first suspect, Alexander Petrov. And these are the details that appear on his passport, the information we're looking for, his first name, his patronomic and his uh, place of birth. So there's various online databases that you can actually go to and offline databases. And this is one we acquired from 2013, the St. Petersburg resident database, which has him listed with the same date of birth or has someone listed with the same date of birth and the same place of birth, but it's different second names. So we were quite interested in who this person could be. It was a bit of a coincidence. He also lived um, on this street. And that's an interesting street because um, and we also have his telephone number. And we could find him on other databases as well um, in the same apartment. And that apartment is actually across the road from the St. Petersburg Military Medical Academy. And it appears it was a kind of like a uh, residency hall for people who are actually attending that academy. So there was this military link we had now discovered between this uh, individual. But how could we be sure he was the same person? Well, we started digging into this identity uh, more and more. We discovered an online phone directory and th- with his name in it that had a phone number which linked us to a car insurance database, which linked him to a Volvo XC90. And that XC90 was registered in 2013, uh, 2012 in St. Petersburg, but then registered in Moscow a year later. And it was registered in this district, which is interesting because that district houses the headquarters of the GRU in St. Petersburg. And it just happens in the 2014 car registration database, which we also acquired, that the same address is listed 
as his uh, the address of uh, where he uh, his car is registered, which is the GRU headquarters. Now we were getting more and more clues that this was the same person. It became incredibly suspicious that someone with the same birth date, the same place of birth, and the same first name uh, was registering his car at the headquarters of the GRU. And you might think, well, that's a really stupid thing for someone to do. What kind of you know spy would register their car at the headquarters of the GRU? Well. This is another spy who did that because uh, later on uh, there was a uh, GRU team arrested trying to hack the Wi-Fi network of the OPCW and some of their identities were um, published by the local media. So we did the same trick. We looked into this guy in the car registration database and we found he had actually had his car registered to the headquarters of basically the cyber um, kind of uh, infiltration unit of the GRU along with 305 other people who registered their cars there. So we basically then had a list of 305 potential GRU officers who had registered their car to the same building. And you might wonder why they do that. Well, it means that if you're drunk driving or going through a red light or anything like that, and someone pulls you over and they look up your number plate, they're going to see that your car is registered to the GRU building and they're going to leave you alone. So, um, we were looking into the medical academy and his past experiences and other kind of details around that. Um, and we actually then managed to acquire a pop, a pop copy of Mishkin's passport. So this is his real identity. And we can actually see it's the same person who was traveling under the fake identity. We then went to um, a university where um, there was an expert in facial recognition and analysis, compare the two faces that were taken 15 years apart and had a very high percentage probability of a match anything over 70 percent could be considered a very strong match so getting up to kind of 90 91 percent was an incredibly strong match especially considering the dates between the two photographs so we had identified our first russian spy um we then actually had someone go out from our partner the insider to his home village and here it is. It's basically in the middle of effectively what's kind of um, permafrost and kind of swampy land. You can only get there a couple of weeks of the year by road because the roads are basically all mud tracks and the ground is so soft that you can't actually drive over it that easily. So there's only one way into the town most of the year is using a single gauge railroad road line that goes in and out of the town um, once a day. So we had one of our colleagues from the Insider Russian publication go there and start asking questions about this guy, which was a bit nerve wracking because this isn't the sort of place where you can have kind of, you know, phone access. There's no kind of 4G here. So we were kind of nervously waiting for him to leave the town if he was going to leave it at all. And he went around and this gives you a sense of what this place is like. This is kind of the heart of the town. It's really, really rural. This is the kind of main mode of transport. And our colleague went around and he spoke to various people and showed the photographs and they were all very proud of him they were saying that he was a hero of russia he'd been awarded the hero of russia award by Pu vladimir putin himself in fact his grandmother who lived in the town had a photograph of him being given the medal in uh, her home and um this was interesting as putin had actually spoken about these guys saying we don't know who they are they just seem to be innocent civilians and we had actually discovered he'd personally met one of them and given them a medal so we started looking into Ruslan Boshrov. Now, we tried the same technique, looking for the same first name and the other details, but it just didn't work. So we started putting together a profile. We thought he'd be a GRU officer focusing on Western Europe. We thought he'd be a graduate in a CERT because based on his age. Um, we looked for schools with the best reputation for these foreign operations, and we found one, the Far Eastern Military Command Academy. And we looked for people between 2001 and 2003 who attended it. We had some clues, like we found this photograph and we thought this could be the same guy. We eventually discovered it wasn't, but this is kind of one of the kind of things we found showing they were kind of in uniform. But we did discover that seven of those school graduates were bestowed the Hero of Russia Award. So we started thinking maybe both of those team, the assassination team, were actually heroes of russia and we looked into all seven of them and we managed to find details of six of them but one of them was no details at all anywhere that we could find and that was uh, antonio shapiga so we started digging into this guy because he was the only one we didn't have a photograph of so we started looking for various search terms, looking for every single thing we could think of to see if we could find this guy in Russia. We found him in a 2003 residential database and he registered himself to a military unit. 
And that military unit was the Spetsnaz unit of the GRU's 14th Brigade. And this gave us a kind of more indication that this guy, after he'd been trained, had gone on to join the GRU. We found him in the 2012 residential database. And again, this is all just databases that have been kind of leaked and published online. And we literally have hundreds of these databases collected now. And we found his name, his date of birth, and we started comparing that to the details we had on the form. And we started fight. He changed his name, but the date of birth was the same. And we eventually again managed to get his uh, in the middle his uh, passport photograph from his real passport, and we had the same facial recognition done that allowed us to confirm that this again was the same person that had been uh, involved with the poisoning. And he was a, again a hero of Russia, a GRU officer. And in fact, we found on the uh, this is a photograph that a tourist took who had visited the museum of his military unit. And this was what actually one of many photographs we eventually discovered where we could actually see his photograph and his name on the wall underneath the heroes of Russia of that unit. And as we said before, that Putin himself is the one who goes and awards these decorations. So, again, he would have known or at least met these two individuals and given them a medal each. Now, a third suspect was identified because a, um, uh, another Russian news site found another passport in the same sequence as uh, Petrov and Boshirov and uh, someone called Sergei Fed Fedotov, who seemed to be a third uh, person. So we started looking into him. There were some interesting details. He flew to London just before the Scripple suspects. His number was close to the other fake IDs. We acquired his travel data. And all his border crossing data, his passenger name record data, his Russian police passenger monitoring system data, and started piecing together what he was actually doing and who he was. The first thing to do was figuring out what his real identity was. So we had some clues to who he was, and he had his name listed on residential databases. The oh, the problem is, on the actual local databases, he was on the Moscow databases, but not on the one for the local region. He didn't exist. Um, so it seemed like his identity had only been created on one of these databases. We also discovered he was employed by a company that existed on paper, but had never traded, which is also suspicious. We also found his home address. And when we called up the number on the home address, there was a family living there who's had no idea who we were talking about. And... Um, we managed to get his passport file, and it was issued by the same passport desk as Boshrov and Petrov. It's a passport desk that is used either for intelligence officers or VIPs. Um, it was also the same reason we had the second form that was blank. It had the same issue that it was in, the previous passport was supposedly unusable. And it also showed that the passport number that had been issued supposedly in his hometown didn't appear on any of the databases that they should have appeared on. So this was a fake number for the passport. So what was really interesting is when we got his domestic passport from the central Russian database, the live database, again, using these data brokers that are just selling all sorts of information online, there was no passport record that existed whatsoever, even though that passport had been used and there were records of this passport being used and registered. And we had a second source confirm that because that was important because this passport we knew had been used because records existed. And now those records had all been purged from the system. And that indicated that um, someone at a state level had removed his passport data. And we believe that, of course, this would be the, you know, the Russian GRU who are doing this um, purging. Eventually, we managed to acquire this extremely blurry photograph of him from one of his border crossings. And um, we started looking into his real identity. So we started using combinations of his, um, like we had before, of his first name, his patronomic, his birth date. But we weren't finding many things on many of his um, cases, but we found using his middle name and his date of birth, we found 15 results. Most of those people, again, we could identify through open sources and eliminate them. But there was only one who didn't exist on the Internet whatsoever, uh, Dennis Sergeyev. And we got his details. This is the real identity of the person that we're seeking. So we discovered he was registered at this address which is the dormitory of the GRU's Military Diplomatic Academy. As you're probably noting already, there are certain patterns that keep being used. And the more we do these investigations, the more of these patterns we identify, making it even easier and quicker to do the next investigation into the next assassination, of which there are quite a few.
Now, we had to find a facial recognition for him. And we realized from his military service, he would have actually served um, in a conflict back in the 90s. And there was a documentary made about that conflict. And it just happened he featured in the documentary. And this is a still of him in the documentary where he's talking about being wounded. And we had a facial recognition done. And even though we had one low quality image and an image that was nearly 30 years old, we still got a 78, 78.2% match, which is beyond the 78, 70% threshold. Um, and again, you can see like the shape of his ears and those kind of details still match. Ears are actually quite revealing when you've got these kind of passport photographs. They, they're almost like a fingerprint. We also got his detailed phone records because, again, you can go on the Internet, find people in Russia selling detailed phone records. So what you're seeing here is um, a representation representation of that data because you don't just get their phone numbers and who they've been calling and when they've been calling them. You get every single telephone tower they've been masked they've connected to along with the coordinates of those masts so if you have someone's detailed phone records you can track them on the day they're for example arriving at Heathrow airport and going to the hotel in the center of london so we're able to track him through london and we discovered that on the day that the uh, assassins went to salisbury that they actually crossed paths just before they went off to london now, we also, with the rest of his travel records that we acquired, found uh, he had been all over the world. But there's one that jumped out in particular in 2015 in uh, Bulgaria, because in the dates that he was in Bulgaria, um, this guy, Emilian Gebrev, had fallen extremely ill. And Emilian Gebrev is a Bulgarian arms dealer. And at the time when he fell ill, he, he was extremely seriously ill. He, completely mysteriously he was taken to a hospital where he was treated he eventually recovered and he wanted an investigation done into it and the bulgarian local authorities dismissed it as basically a case of food poisoning suggesting that maybe there had been some uh pesticide left on a salad that he had eaten at some point um and he had his blood samples tested by an independent laboratory which found signs of organophosphate poisoning um but they weren't looking for novichok because no one was thinking that this was a novichok poisoning but the chemicals that byproducts in his blood did indicate that a nerve agent could have been used but the local authorities at the time dismissed this as a case of you know unfortunate food poisoning we started looking into this and not only did we show that this third scripple suspect had been in um bulgaria near to where he was around the time he was poisoned but we also discovered there was an entire team of glu officers who had actually been traveling back and forth to bulgaria even to the point of booking a hotel room uh, looking overlooking the car park where his car was parked on the day it was poisoned, specifically asking the hotel for that booking. And we actually contacted the hotel and found out that information. That was interesting because once we kind of published some of this stuff, the UK authorities started asking the Bulgarian authorities to look into this a bit more. And the Bulgarian authorities found this interesting piece of CCTV footage. This was actually taken on the day he was poisoned, a few hours before he um, fell ill. And a guy walks into the parking garage. And you can see he's wearing this hat. It's pulled down. It looks like he's got sunglasses on, black gloves. He's looking as suspicious as possible. He walks over to the car of Emilian Gebrev. And he disappears for a short while behind the car. And then he walks back from the side of the car. And as he's walking away, he keeps looking over at the side of the car where he's just been. And we strongly believe this is actually the moment when the poison was applied to the car handle. Uh, and this is one of the poisoners who was responsible for um, the assassination attempt. So we had now discovered that there wasn't just one nerve agent assassination attempt there was now two nerve agent assassination attempts and in fact he was actually poisoned again a couple of months later and by checking those travel records we could see the same team had actually returned to bulgaria and started following him again just before the poison at his second poisoning um and what was really interesting is not only did we have the phone records that showed where these people had been, but who they'd been calling. And they'd been calling other GRU officers, they'd been calling their bosses and their subordinates, but they'd also been calling chemists. And there were chemists who um, had been working at a number of institutes inside Russia, um, kind of scattered about. And what was interesting about every single person they were calling who was involved with chemistry is they were all members of Russia's uh, former Novichok program. Now, Russia's Novichok pr program was supposed to be shut down when they joined the Chemical Weapons Convention. But what we were discovering was these scientists who made up that original program had actually not really been uh, kind of uh, 
uh, shut down. They'd be moved to other institutes. In fact, this one you can see here, the Signal Institute, is actually producing sports nutrition. Um, and if you remember, the Scripple suspect said they were actually sports nutrition salesmen. So I, I don't know if that was some kind of weird assassin in joke there. Um, so um, we started piecing together who these people were. And um, that became really useful when we started looking into the um, poison of the opposition leader, Navalny, because when he was poisoned in August 2020, we started thinking, well, if he's been poisoned with Novichok, then we know the people who are the Novichok chemists. Let's get their phone records. And again, these phone records, you can just buy them off the Internet. So we got them and we discovered he'd been uh, this. The chemists had been calling FSB officers and these FSB officers have been kind of calling each other in a kind of network, which, you know, this pin board kind of demonstrates here. And this team in particular had been calling each other just before Navani had been poisoned. We also um, got all their travel records and we could demonstrate they had been following Navani, not just on one trip, but on multiple trips. We found that I think it, we, no, we're now up to 40 journeys where Navani was followed by members of this same team. And this uh, graphic shows that when Navani actually traveled to the destination where he was poisoned, the officers who followed him to uh, hit the airport he flew to and another nearby airport, and then showing them after the operation going to this other location, Gorno Atalisk, I've probably pronounced that wrong, um, where they seem to have been debriefed. And throughout this entire process, they were calling these chemists. Um, up until the point the kind of poisoning was done and then they just didn't call them again. We also discovered that they'd fo been following Navalny on a trip where, where his wife had fallen ill um, in July um, 2020. And we believe that's actually another poisoning that wasn't reported at that time. Navalny um, decided not to talk about that publicly previously because he didn't want to sound kind of paranoid, like, oh, the FSB are poisoning me. And it turned out this was actually the case. So um, we uh, published this um, story. And obviously it had a kind of quite a big impact. One thing we also did is we, um, on the morning we were publishing the story, um, Chris O'Grosov, my colleague, and Navani were together and they called up um, one of the poisoners. And Navani used, a, or we, we used a phone spoofing app that we put in the number of the FSB headquarters. So to the guy picking up the phone, it looked like the FSB was calling. And Navani basically pretended to be a uh, assistant to a very senior FSB officer and convinced the guy to give a um, report on the entire operation. And it was a, over a 50 minute phone call where he described in intimate detail exactly where they um, poisoned, how they did the poisoning. His job, the guy we called, was uh, actually the cleanup crew. He was supposed to clean this up. And he even explained exactly where they applied the poisoning, which was in the inner seam of the basically the, the um, fly of his uh, underwear. So they, they literally poisoned his dick. And um, so um, this is kind of what the, uh, you know, th this was just so stunning to us because we did not expect we would have someone confessing to being part of a massive poisoning operation. And to Navalny's credit, he basically just, he acted the role. He basically bullied the guy into giving a full confession. The guy was giving status reports and uh, information and say, giving kind of performance reviews for his colleague one at a time. And the thing is, we this allowed us to confirm that these colleagues were involved in the operation. So we, Navalny would say, oh, what about this guy? And the guy would say, oh, yeah, he did this. And I thought he did really well. It was To be fair, this uh, FSB officer was very generous to all his colleagues and their uh, performance. And he said he couldn't really understand why the poisoning didn't work. He, he said it's probably because Navalny, the plane turned around. And when he they landed on the ground, he managed to get just, fortunately, the right medication given to him at the right time that actually slowed the effect of the poisoning. Um, we got, because of these phone details as well, we could see, you know, what the, there was one guy who turned his, um, they were using burner phones, but they kept ex accidentally turning on their main phones, which he had the records for. So here you can see he's six minutes, uh, one guy turned his phone on and he was six minutes away from the Xander hotel on the night Navani was poisoned. So we could actually place him very close to the hotel. We could show when they flew in as well. One guy landed in, um, uh, the, the, uh, airport turned his wrong phone on, it pinged the local cell phone tower with like one byte of data and he turned it off immediately. But we had that ping and it allowed us to start placing these people close to where um, Navani was. We then started looking at more of these travels because we started noticing that um, they've been traveling a lot, not just following Navani. 
And we kind of crowdsourced, basically we shared these um, travel itineraries um, for all these FSB officers um, f- through Twitter and basically asked people if they recognized any of the dates or and locations. And people started coming to us talking about people who had died in the mysterious circumstances during some of these trips. And what you're seeing here is three individuals who were um, killed um, when they were being followed by this FSB team. Um, the guy on the left is basically part of the official Russian uh, anti-corruption opposition, the kind of allowed opposition who got a bit too big for his boots and was seemingly assassinated. Two guys on the right were basically just local activists, um, basically very local. They didn't have any real international, even national profile, but working on kind of rights issues. So it wasn't just big figures like Navalny being targeted. It was really minor activists. Um, we discovered then that Vladimir Karamurza, who's quite a major Russian opposition figure. He was a close uh, uh, colleague of Boris Nemstov, who was uh, murdered outside the Kremlin. Um, And he had fallen mysteriously ill in two occasions in 2015 and 2017. On both of those occasions, he was followed by the FSB team. And he was actually flown out to the US for treatment and recovered, but he still has long term effects. We think that's because he was. uh, helping Boris Nom- Nemstov in the US promote the Magnitsky Act, which was uh, the, these, uh, this act to basically allow sanctions to be put against human rights violators. And this is something that's been quite a big issue, and we believe this is why he was targeted. Um, we're still looking into more of these um, killings. We have at least five more individuals. There's a very strong indication that they were targeted by this same FSB um, assassination team. And we're continuing to find kind of even more cases and more assassinations assassinations and these are just the chemical weapons assassinations we're actually currently in court in berlin over a case of an assassination using a kind of old-fashioned kind of a shooting um and we're, we're expecting the results of that case to be announced in may and that could be actually quite a big moment because in that case this burning bicycle assassination murder as we're calling it that investigation which revealed this guy who was the assassin who was arrested in germany was actually an fs linked to the fsb are the same methodologies that we used in these investigations so our hope is that if the berlin court accepts that evidence then it will um you know the the work we've done on these other assassinations will get a kind of another look by uh, kind of governments and policymakers and hopefully be taken a lot more seriously um and that's um bellingcat and what we've been doing to hunt russian assassins so well, I'm sure everybody would agree that was absolutely fascinating uh, to to see the the methodical nature of the work that uh, that Elliot and his team do over at Bellingcat. Um, I'm sure you've got lots of questions uh, to put to Elliot. We've got quite a few in our uh, our slide already. Uh, if you want to contribute your own question, you can go to sitp uh, dot online forward slash ask. Uh, you can also see there all the questions that have been asked so far and upvote the ones that you think uh, you really want to hear uh, hear answered. Uh, you can make a Donation, as I say, at SITP uh, dot online forward slash donate. The links in the in the chat there, and obviously buy if you're interested in all this. Buy Elliot's book, uh, We Are Bellingcat, which is uh, available from uh, all good reputable bookstores, uh, and that other one that we all know is <laughs> exists and is maybe less reputable. Um, we're going to have a break now. It is uh, twenty to eight, so we'll be back at five to eight uh, for the Q and A, where we'll put all of your questions to Elliot. So go get yourself a drink, uh, relax, and we'll see you at five to eight. Uh, hope- Attention, this transmission hasn't been approved by authorities. This incident will be reported. Remain seated. Appropriate forces are already dispatched. Now, how do I turn this off, Yobane? That was a bit strange. Um, I think we've got everything back again now. Um, just checking yet. Yeah, and no, I think we're we're all all right. Uh, we've recaptured our, our streams. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Hope you all had a, a nice break. Uh, I can see that we've had loads of really interesting questions uh, asked. So uh, first of all, please welcome back to the stream here our speaker this evening, Elliot Higgins. I'm sure the, the chat is filling with clapping emojis uh, right now. Um, Seeing the the, the chat uh, throughout uh, the talk, though, Elliot, uh, really, it was, it was, I think the audience was was as into the talk as I was. I thought it was such a really fantastic, utterly fascinating uh, view at how to methodically piece together um, an investigation in a way that you know provides real 
proof, real evidence, uh, and, and cut through speculation. Um, but as well as the audience uh, being appreciative of the work that you're doing, um, one theme did come through quite strongly in the questions, which is the audience have genuine concerns for you and your health. Um, we had a question from Stu, uh, who asked, uh, in your work, you must make some serious enemies. Do you have a fear for your personal safety or those around you? Uh, and uh, Dave J um, added to that to ask, do you, do you take any extra steps to protect yourself um, after you've done investigations uh, like into the, the Russia uh, stuff. Yeah, I mean, we've pretty much had a constant escalation from about 2015 in the way kind of Russia has been, you know, mad at us, basically. It really started in 2015 um, when we revealed that the missile launcher that shot down MH17 came from a Russian military base. Um, that's when we first started having the Russian media, kind of Russia Today, Sputnik, and kind of national Russian media doing more and more kind of reports on us, all of which were negative and, you know, questioned, who, you know, who we were, you know, it, it kind of started off, you know, the first phase was kind of like, oh, they're amateurs. Why is anyone listening to them? Um, more recently with the Scripple stuff, they've kind of moved into uh, saying that we're um, we're kind of working for the CIA or MI5 or MI6, kind of depending on, you know, the day of the week. Um, and um, more recently, I mean, there was even an article recently in the Russian media where they were basically saying that I uh, didn't actually exist. I was a fabrication. And this wasn't like <laughs> Russia's main state news. So it got kind of reprinted across Russia that I didn't actually exist. Um, we've also had an escalation in, um, as well, kind of cyber attacks. We were targeted in the same hacking campaign that targeted um, in 2015 and 16 that was um, targeted the Hillary Clinton campaign and about 5,000 other people. We mm -hmm. didn't get, we just ignored it. We didn't even realize it was a phishing campaign. We just thought it was some kind of dumb kind of, you know, attempt to steal our credit card numbers. But when the information came out about that, we discovered it was something more serious. There's a more recent campaign as well, targeting about 30 or 40 Russia-focused researchers uh, on Proton Mail. So we've had to be really careful about our kind of online security. So using stuff like um, security keys, physical security keys and stuff like that to secure our accounts. Um, we also have to be very careful about our physical safety. So our kind of office addresses are we try and keep those as hidden as much as possible. Mm. Um, and uh, of course, now more recently, because of the scribble stuff we have to be worried about our physical security so for example local kind of police in the uk counter-terrorism police have been in touch with me and are in regular contact so just you know check up on me and make sure that i'm kind of feeling fairly safe and secure they've given me kind of security advice um it and then there's like little stuff with our behavior like if we're going if i go abroad which obviously isn't much of an option at the moment but when i was <laughs> going abroad um, I just stopped eating food in hotels. I wouldn't get room service or eat any of the mini bar or basically anything I haven't like purchased myself directly from, you know, a supermarket. I can't eat when I'm raw because I just don't know if there could have been some kind of, you know, rushing who's just started working at the, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> It, it sucks I can't get room service because I get to stay at some nice hotels, but <laughs> I have to go to the local supermarket and you just get like a pack of sandwiches that are terrible. So, um, but you know, it's not the end of the world. But yeah, I mean, we do ha we all have to be quite concerned about that. I want my colleagues is involved with the um, Berlin um, bicycle murder case at the moment where there was an FSB assassin, basically. And we identified that he was an FSB assassin, not the person he claimed to be when he was arrested. And he's had to have an immense amount of security around him. He's had all kinds of security to keep him safe during that trial so it is a you know, very consider serious consideration of our work mm. and really I, we kind of have decided that the best way to kind of maybe be safe is have a higher profile as possible that you know it's like if i stub my toe and post about it on twitter people will blame russia for it so you know <laughs> worse than that i can uh, we, we kind of just hope that is enough to keep them away yeah, yeah. Um, we had a, an interesting question here from uh, Ali, and I think it was reflected in, in several of the other questions uh, as well. Ali says, I uh, love what you do. Um, do you ever worry that by sharing the techniques you use, you'll give the perpetrators the information they need to evade detection? And someone else was saying, does talking about your work in this way, does it jeopardize your ability to carry on doing this work because you're you're publicizing the methods that you're using? Well, I mean, it's unfortunately something we have to do is be as transparent as possible. I mean, when you're using open source information, it's a lot easier to show your sources. But like with these investigations I've just shared you, the difficulty with that is this is not freely publicly available information in the traditional sense. Even though it's very easy to acquire this information if you know where to look, it's not like looking for social media posts or satellite imagery on Google Earth, anyone can do, you know, immediately. Um, so we had to be kind of very transparent about how we acquired this because, for example, when we published out the Varney story, the Russian kind of foreign ministry said that, you know, gave a press conference 
conference saying that we were working for, you know, British intelligence services. The UK ambassador, the Russian ambassador to the UK gave a press conference where he repeatedly said that we were working for the British deep establishment, as he described it. I think he was trying to avoid deep state, but he said that repeatedly and that we were being paid for by the British intelligence services. Um, So by being transparent, like when we published the Navani article, we actually did an article explaining where we got these sources from without linking to them directly because it's linking to illegal activity in Russia, at least. And that's actually, actually linking directly to the data would be illegal in russia to do that so we have to be a bit careful about that but um that then you know when when the russian state was saying that we were working for the spies and this was all our information came from russian media actually went and brought the same data we did and actually said no this is actually stuff you can just bath the internet (laughs) and that actually helps a lot with kind of you know showing that you know what we're doing is authentic so when we actually released this stuff it was only because you know this is like literally a russian nerve agent assassination against one of the major opposition leaders mm. so it's very hard you know it was, it was kind of worth in a sense almost revealing that and risking burning those sources but even with the scripple case we saw russia taking action against um kind of the information we were using so I, I showed you those passport forms with the photographs and i said there was a sequence of them we actually went back and brought a few in that sequence and all the photographs had been removed after we published then we published about that and we went back and had a look at another one of the forms and the photograph hadn't been removed it had been replaced and the reason we knew it was replaced is because for some reason they'd replaced a man's photograph with a woman's photograph on that passport form um so they and even now like when when they go and like they do remove data from databases on the live databases but we have copies of the offline databases going Mm -hmm. back years so we can actually see when they're removing stuff and who they've removed it from so in a way the act of trying to cover it up just actually just puts a kind of big sign saying this is someone worth looking into on those individuals even when we were doing the mh17 case which then led us to discover more about russia's involvement in ukraine the uh, russian duma actually passed a law to stop soldiers sharing social media posts about their military service because that's where we were getting the evidence that russia was in ukraine so they have reacted against us but at the same time i mean really we've only done you know the tip of the iceberg of what's possible with this kind of stuff and only really in a few parts of the world so what we often find is when we move into a we do a kind of investigation into a new it's something happening in a new part of the world the local authorities haven't heard of Bellingcat or open source investigation and they give the usual oh, fake news kind of denials yeah and that's actually happened this week with ethiopia where we examined a video of the ethiopian army massacring civilians mm. and they kind of put out a mess yeah, a whole thing saying oh this is completely untrue it's completely fake but this has actually happened before in uh, kind of Africa, funnily enough. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a video of uh, civilians in Cameroon being executed by soldiers. And they literally gave a press conference saying it was fake news and saying this wasn't in Cameroon. And a year later, thanks to our investigation, we were actually able to show uh, there was actually a court case where the soldiers were identified through open sources, were put mm-hmm. on trial and convicted for those murders. And it literally only happened because that basically we were so annoyed with them saying it was fake news, we just don't <laughs> do it more. Um, um, so yeah, probably this Ethiopia stuff is going to get a lot more of a closer look. But um, you know, it's it's kind of is you know even when it, you know one kind of avenue of explanation shuts down, there's like a billion others we can be looking into on a whole range of different subjects. Yeah, um, from there, there's there's so many places I can go with the next questions that we have from from what you're just saying. But when you were talking about how um, people would write you off as being working for the UK UK government, being part of the the spy network of the UK government, funny enough, we got uh, even a little taste of that just by putting a Facebook advert up uh, of uh, people responding to it, saying, "Well, this is just uh, GCHQ uh, recruit recruiting that kind of thing." Um, but it does bring me to, to a question from Bremner, uh, who asked, um, "Could you and have you used similar techniques to find?" UK spies, or I guess UK misdeeds. I mean, it's, in regards to the Russian spy stuff, it's pretty unique to Russia because you can't buy that kind of data, that level of data anywhere else in the world that we're aware of. I mean, this is literally mm. like the entire government. Every scrap of information gathered by the Russian government, which is effectively a police state, is available for purchase. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, really. And you just don't get that anywhere else in the world. 
as for open source investigation more broadly, I mean, we've investigated a whole range of issues, um, although we're kind of very well known for the work we've done on Russia. Um, I mean, we've done a whole range of issues. I mean, for example, we've been um, working a lot on justice and accountability and the use of open source investigation in that. Um, and one of the things we were focusing on were initially when we were kind of developing the processes and methodologies for this. So the idea is that if we can develop a process for archiving evidence and investigating evidence that can then be used in justice and accountability proceedings be they courts or hearings or whatever they may be um, that will allow us to create like a base level for the quality of open source investigation and we developed that actually with um, Saudi airstrikes in Yemen and that use that to actually the cases we did actually use that to try and challenge um, uh, UK arms exports to Saudi Arabia for example um, and we've been testing these methodologies you know in a variety of um, places because there's a lot of value to using this kind of evidence, but we've looked into things like, for example, we did a survey of NATO airstrikes and civilian casualties uh, in Afghanistan with the uh, Bureau of uh, um, Investigative Journalism. Um, we've um, looked into a US airstrike in Syria where they bombed a mosque um and they claimed it wasn't actually a mosque it was an al-qaeda meeting location and by piecing together open source footage and working with um forensic architecture based at goldsmiths university created a 3d model and recreation of the building and proved it was a working mosque when they mm -hmm. bombed it and it was a really horrific incident actually they they i mean they obliterated the build it half the building very precisely and then when people were running out of the building and these were we, as far as we can tell civilians they fired high hellfire missiles at them as they were retreating from the building so it's like a really horrific incident but again you can you can really apply open source investigation to pretty much area, any area you want where there is user-generated content coming from it. Even if there's just satellite imagery of an area that's interesting, you might be able to find stuff out about it. I mean, we've used satellite imagery, for example, to find um, the exact locations of executions, mass executions by ISIS and uh, kind of Libyan um, kind of brigadier commanders. Uh, a very notorious case of a guy called Wafali who was actually murdered recently. He was uh, indicted by the ICC because he put these videos on his Facebook page of his basic unit executing people he said were ISIS um, and we actually geolocated them using the blood stains on satellite imagery to find the precise location they were actually executed so there's a whole range of different things you could investigate using this um, and it for me now, I mean, it's looking at, you know, what's happening with, you know, the Ethiopian situation, for example, just not having enough resources to investigate any, every single thing that's worth investigating is very frustrating. But this is why we mm. go out and we train people and we show people how to do this stuff. Um, so we've established you're not working for uh, the UK government and you're not turning, you're not, not uh, at the moment, turning this uh, investigation uh, techniques on the UK government. Um, but Trevor Smith asks, um, are you doing the British intelligence agencies work for them? Are they researching to this level? Are they employing these kind of techniques to, to uncover stuff themselves? I mean, well, I only hear stuff anecdotally. I mean, there, I think there has been a growing recognition of the value of open source investigation. And what's, what's quite unusual, I think, is this entire kind of movement of online open source investigation really only started to evolve from around 2010 onwards with the early days of the Arab Spring. I think really the first moment where we, you know, there are people online watching what was happening in Tahrir Square and in Cairo when the kind of, uh, you know, police and military were fighting against the kind of people occupying the square and it's being live streamed was the first moment of that. And that's where I started getting interested in, you know, that and then the conflict in Libya and realizing you could do these things like geolocation and teaching ourselves and that whole community was, was basically made up of keen amateurs like myself um, people who were working for human rights organizations or news organizations who were doing this as kind of like a side thing in their own mm. free time but it wasn't something that was coming from a professional community so because we only had open source information that meant we had to extract like every bit of information we could for it and be more innovative and i think in more traditional organizations not just the intelligence organizations but human rights organizations news organizations they didn't really have in a sense the capacity to recognize the value of it because it requires you watching lots of youtube videos all day and if you say to your boss i need to watch youtube videos today you know for an interesting thing they get you know back in 2010 they would say no absolutely not but over the last 10 
10 years, this has actually become more kind of mainstreamed in a whole range of different fields. And I'm, I'm sure the intelligence services are taking open source investigation more seriously. I, I see, you know, quotes from, you know, people who work in the intelligence services saying like 80% of the useful information now comes from open sources rather than closed sources. Um, and, you know, this, it's not just about what's being shared on social media, but the increasing availability of satellite imagery to the public. You know, Google Earth, you can go on and find huge amounts of satellite imagery, but there's more and more services that are providing imagery that you can provide. And it's a really big part of what you can do as an investigator. Um, we had a couple of questions, um, one from Anonymous and one from a, a chap called uh, Red Brown. Um, and the question is, um, how much of the work that you're doing relies on corruption in the country in which you're researching where this data can then come out of? The fact that Russia has these vast tranches of data that are that are available and can be bought uh, in those kind of ways. And um, from what country would you have the hardest time getting data that could identify individuals? Well, um I think our kind of Russian assassination investigations are pretty unique in the way that we can get that kind of data. I mean, it's very rare to find anything even close to that in any other country that we've encountered so far. Mm. Um, I mean, you, you probably find stuff like that in Ukraine, knowing what Ukraine's like, but um, it is actually quite unusual. Uh, so, I mean, most of the stuff we do, most of the investigations we do are actually relied on what's been shared online by individuals. And that can encompass a massive amount of things. For example, um, this Sunday, we, um, NBC in the US is going to be broadcasting a 60-minute um, piece that we've worked on them um, on the January 6th violence. And there we've taken all the videos that were shared by people in the crowd, literally over a thousand videos, watched them all and put them into sequence. So we can mm -hmm. actually, so we have a very detailed idea of actually how the day evolved and where the violence kind of erupted and those kind of details. But that was literally just people filming stuff and pulling it online on, you know, Parler and Twitter and, you know, YouTube and just finding it all and piecing it together. And that gives us a great deal of insight into what happened. I mean, it's so, I mean even with the Wafali case I mentioned before, that was his military unit posting the videos on Facebook. This wasn't like super <laughs> hidden information. My, in fact, one of my first really big stories back when I was doing my um, blog before Balling Cat, which is, uh, it's called the Brown Mo this blog named after a Frank Zappa song, which I just picked randomly. Um, and then I got known as kind of Brown Moses. And I, I was like interviewed on CNN explaining what Brown Moses is. And I say it's just a Frank Zappa song. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, my first big story there was I basically spent about a year in 2012 looking at videos from Syria and effectively teaching myself to identify weapons and do open source investigation. In early 2013, the rebel group started posting videos online that featured weapons I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And I looked into them and discovered they were all coming from the former Yugoslavia and not the local region. And I worked with the New York Times and basically uncovered a secret Saudi smuggling operation to the rebels in Syria based off the YouTube videos that they'd been posting themselves on the internet. And it blew the, it was the first solid evidence that the, these, although there were rumors this was happening, allegations, it was the first solid evidence. And it'd been posted on YouTube videos. So you don't have to, this Russia stuff is quite unusual for the work we do because there is a vast amount you can do with just publicly available information, stuff shared often by the perpetrators themselves. Yeah, that was the stuff that really uh, impressed me about um, the, the January 6th uh, capital uh, stuff. You can't have many situations where the very people in their thousands, the very people committing the crimes are broadcasting it live to the internet in a way that uh, is just a gift, I guess, to uh, to your team piecing it all together. I saw even the the pieces that you did piecing together the movements of, of the people who died and exactly where they were. It's, it's remarkable to be able to put that clear a picture together of what was clearly such a chaotic event but i guess the fact that they're filming it themselves and and not expecting that these uh, techniques exist to, to put it together is kind of what's uh what's their their um undoing i guess in all of this um, yeah and, uh, one thing that was i found really fascinating when reviewing all these videos and i, I spent hours doing it I, I, it's the trump supporters because they were trump supporters filming other trump supporters they weren't censoring themselves so they were very, being very open about their motivations, which were kind of a, a mixture of racism and conspiracy theories. Yeah. But they were very open about what they were saying, the way they were acting, what they were saying to each other. Um, and I'm hoping when the um, film is broadcast on Sunday, that will kind of really re be reflected in um, you know what the footage we found. I think there was so much swearing there, I'm not sure what footage they could actually use <laughs> constantly. <laughs> And I guess this kind of comes into a question we have from Phil, which is um, how much work are you doing investigating cases where Western allies are the suspects? And I guess in America, the, the people storming the Capitol were probably the closest thing to the, being the suspects and allies at the same time. 
I mean, we've um, in the US, we've mainly focused on um, civil disturbance. Like we examined the Black Lives Matter protests when the uh, police were using a lot of violence, both against the protesters and uh, the um, journalists. And we actually made a, we collected hundreds and hundreds of videos showing this and created a map where you could actually explore all these violations of the police attacking journalists. And some of it was like really blatant. Like this uh, one video that really stood out to me was it was a video. It was like in a kind of like a gas station. Um, and there was a journalist lying on the ground holding up his ID as police were walking by shouting I'm a journalist waving his press ID and lots of police walked by and one guy just walks up one police officer and sprays him directly in the face with pepper spray even though he's prone and completely harmless and there's so many examples of that we've looked into stuff you know as I said before the Saudi airstrikes but also the weapons being used in those which often come from the UK and the US Um, and we've done quite a bit on kind of various arms control types issues as well um, yeah, I mean, we do work on quite a wide range of subjects. And and because the Russia stuff is obviously so big, like nerve agent assassinations get no, noticed and shooting down yeah. airlines is get no, noticed. And these investigations, like with MH17, this wasn't like we – it was an evolving investigation that first was kind of the different parts of what was happening with the MH17 case. And because there was so much Russian disinformation, that gives us more to kind of work with because – it's one thing to prove something happened, but it's also not, it's more interesting to prove a state is lying about what happened than do it categorically. Yeah. But when we were doing that investigation, I mean, we're still doing investigations related to MH17 now, but because that involved looking at material from the conflicts in Ukraine and Russia was sending troops and equipment over it, in addition to the missile launcher that shot down MH17, that branched off to more investigations that kind of focused on Russia. Now, Prior to that, I've been doing a lot of work on Syria and the whole open source community had kind of focused on the Arab Spring initially, just because that's really where, in a way, it was birthed from. That was kind of the origins of it. So when Russia started bombing Syria, the kind of open source community that had arisen around kind of Ukraine and the open source community around the Arab Spring basically came together. And that's why so often the focus of um, open source investigators have been on those topics, just because of, in a sense, the evolution of that. But as we've become kind of more or, um, you know, Bellingcat was also a volunteer-led organization. So it was what the volunteers were interested in looking into, and that was MH17, because that was the big story when we launched. And that had led us more and more into, um, you know, just kind of following the lead of what people are interested in. But then when we started becoming more of a, um, having more staff, like now we've gone from like one staff member in 2014, me, to 22 staff members now. We kind of can kind of pick and choose the subjects a bit more. And the focus mm. now is the question of how we, we focus on three main areas, um, education, so teaching other people to do it, because the idea is that we're effective because we're part of a large network of investigators who are working on different things. And by spreading the techniques and training people in a whole range of different organizations, it makes the entire open source community kind of stronger and more diverse. And we kind of draw on that from our work. We're also developing technology to in- enable investigations and enable people to work together on in investigations and also the justice and accountability component. So now when we're planning what we're doing with Bellingcat, we're looking at areas where those can, can kind of be built on. And the funny thing is the Russia stuff we've been doing, the Scriffle stuff, is done by a volunteer, not a staff member. It's his mm-hmm. hobby to do this stuff and um he's just extremely good at doing it so it's not like we're telling him to look into russia he's just doing it anyway and he's just you know part of our you know team now but we try and kind of look at a broad range of subjects but the other issue as well you don't want to go too broad because you want to have we're doing this to have an impact and if we start going scattershot going all over the place and there's so many different things we could doing we don't have the kind of serious impact we want to do like for example we've been doing a lot on um border pushbacks in the mediterranean that has have involved frontex and that was a collaborative project we did looking at um how frontex were basically involved with these border pushbacks where basically migrant boats are disabled and then pushed back into turkish territorial waters by the greek yeah. coast guard often under the nose of frontex the border patrol people which is not what they're supposed to be doing and a massive violation of the law and human rights And because we did that investigation, that actually has led to the European Parliament investigating Frontex and withholding some of their funding. Mm. So we do work on the really kind of wide range of issues. It's just our kind of rush stuff is the stuff that (laughs) tends to catch people's attention. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned there about um, the, the the community being um, being large, and you do training with people, and you've got a, a vol- people who are volunteering, and, and because it's a passion project, uh, someone actually asked, um, "Is there a way that people can be involved and help with investigations, things like crowdsourcing? How would people, if they were interested? I'm sure there's lots of people watching now who are really interested. How would they go about learning to to be part of this?" We're currently developing a um, kind of volunteer section for Battling Camp where people will be able to um, be, um, we'll, we'll kind of set tasks for the community, geolocation, quite straightforward stuff. Because basically, if you're, um, th- this kind of like, if you do a simple investigation with a lot of people, that works well. For example, the Europol Trace and Objects campaign where um, Europol were looking, asking the public for help to identify objects that were taken from abuse imagery, like bottles of shampoo, or items of clothing, to help mm. identify where the photographs were taken. And they asked, you know, on Twitter for people to help, but they literally had like 3,000 Twitter followers. So we amplified it to our audience who loves that kind of stuff. And that's where lots of people can get involved. So if you kind of follow Balling Out on social media, you might see us occasionally doing stuff like that and we want to turn that into something that's more consistent through our volunteer section or and that works really well if it's a simple task but it goes horribly wrong when you have lots of people doing something complicated like the reddit boston marathon bombing investigation where they identify yeah. the people with january 6 the same thing happened people were wrongly identified because a large group of people were investigating it and this group think takes hold so when you're doing something that's more complicated you want fewer people working on a smaller tight-knit community so our volunteer section will kind of focus on those more simple tasks but that does have a huge amount of value i mean an example mm-hmm. of that is um when russia again started bombing syria um they were posting gun camera videos on youtube showing bombings saying this is isis being bombed near raqqa and a group of people on the internet like literally five or six people started geolocating all these videos figuring out where they were filmed and by systemizing that process through bailing we were actually able to show that they were lying about who they were bombing and when they were bombing and all these mm-hmm. other things um and but that's kind of using that community and bringing them on board to be part of that so the volunteer section we hope will be part of that but in the time for the time being i mean you can kind of follow us on um twitter and we occasionally put stuff out there and um you know it doesn't hurt you know if you see a video that you think is interesting give it a go geolocating it and you, it, it i mean do, in a way you could do what i did i taught myself how to geolocate stuff without even knowing it was called geolocation we literally yeah. didn't have a word to describe the process <laughs> it was so new um so um that and that was literally just me doing a blog that i didn't expect anyone to read but just being really kind of careful and aware of what i was doing and not wanting to be one of these people who's put, putting bad information out online um that, that's a, a question i think that comes from um that that sort of immediately uh, suggests itself you mentioned about the boston marathon bombing and obviously what we saw on reddit was people doing very bad amateur uh, <laughs> versions of what you're doing like really very very flimsy versions and it caused a lot of harm how do you go about taking the energy that's there to try and find out what's happening and then putting it through the process that allows you to get secondary sources uh, verify things and stop uh, that that sensation of i'm getting onto something i'm just going to follow my hunch and start to make a few leaps and even not necessarily recognize when i'm making leaps how do you start to pull that back and, and keep it robust and rigorous I think you need to kind of provide a structure around it. Like the idea of our volunteer section is we will be able to kind of say, you know, we're interested in this video. Can you tell us more about it or use it to kind of gather information? Like with the um, January 6th violence, we created a spreadsheet and uh, Google form where people could submit links with a kind of description of what it was. And then that fed into a a sheet where duplicates could be removed. Mm. Um, And we told people, you know, we said don't try and identify people. I mean, plenty of people went off and did it. Some of them got it right, some of them got it wrong, and some of those wrong identities resulted in people being harassed. So we don't encourage Mm. people to do that. So on the platform we're developing, we'd be kind of putting up, for example, uh, collections of videos from a conflict where we know they're from a town and we're asking people to geolocate them. Um, And then that would feed back into a kind of larger data set of videos. So for example, we've been working with a group called the Syrian Archive for a long time, and they've collected literally millions of videos and photographs from Syria from a variety of sources. And what they need is good metadata to be added to that, like precise coordinates of where this stuff was filmed, because it's effectively a historical record of what happened in the conflict and also evidence in many cases of war crimes. Um, And that needs to be made available to researchers working at organizations like the IIIM on Syria to investigate these war crimes. But the problem is, if you've got 3 million videos you've downloaded from YouTube and you don't have any way to organize them, it's really difficult. Mm. So what our plan is, we'll be taking batches of those videos, say 20 or 50 videos, 
showing them on our volunteers platform and asking people to geolocate them. And then once they've been geolocated, we can then feed it back into the database and add that metadata and then put another batch through. So we're hoping in the coming years and decades, that will create a data set that is far more easier to search. I would like to see basically, you could go to a map of Syria, highlight part of it, set a date range, it would show you all the geolocated videos in that area. Um, mm. Make it a lot easier for researchers, you know, who are looking to war crimes or, you know, the history of the conflict, you know, maybe even you know, 50 or 60 years time to actually find this stuff. And this is something that arises with and will arise with every kind of conflict that happens in the future. This massive amount of information being shared online and organizations like Bellingcat, in a sense, being the first responders, because the other thing that's not quite important now is with the recognition that there is more and more violent content coming from these conflicts and often content that is violating the terms of services of these platforms is often this content gets taken down very quickly. Yeah. So as a kind of first responder, you have to then archive that material. And that is also one of the reasons we're doing this process of developing this new way of kind of archiving material to meet the standards of a court and making that something we can package up and share with other organizations because we recognize that this is how it's going to be in the future. You aren't going to have the likes of kind of, you know, the ICC or Human Rights Watch gathering this stuff. It will be smaller organizations who are focused on specific conflicts who mm. need to be equipped with software methodologies and training to actually gather this information from day one of a conflict. Not like we have with Syria, where we're still almost figuring out a lot of how we handle this today. Um, and in the process, losing potentially very useful evidence and information about the conflict. Yeah, yeah. Um, from talking about the voluntary side and uh, and how people can help, um, we've got a question from Andrew, which looks at the opposite side of that. Uh, and Andrew asks, uh, do Palantir and such um, do what you do, but for the highest bidder and lack transparency and therefore won't necessarily make the world a better place as you're trying to do? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are private intelligence organisations and people provide platforms like Palantir who um, you know, they are, I mean, they're businesses, they're in the business of making money and Bellingcat is not a business. It's a, it's a NGO, it's a charitable NGO as well. So we're run as a nonprofit. Mm. Um, and for us, it's really, I, I think really at the root of it is basically why I started doing this is because I'm interested in what's happening in these locations, in these conflicts. And I want a deeper understanding of it. And if you start putting a price tag on that and start trying to commoditize it, then you lose the entire point of doing it. It's for us as investigators to learn more about the things that are interesting for us. And through that, actually, in a way, empowering the people who are collecting this evidence on the ground to achieve why the, the goal of why they're doing it, which is that they're filming this stuff because they want the world to know. They want there to be accountability. And really what we're developing the Bellingcat as a process for doing that. And in my view, that's only possible is if we, we keep this open and we keep, you know, we develop stuff that's publicly available. You know, it, we develop, you know, software systems, methodologies that we can share with our organizations because Bellingcat's, you know, I started doing this as a hobby with no money or no way to fund it. And it was only mm. really, I mean, it's, it's only, honestly only been until, you know, I've been doing this since, 2012 first you know, two years with the brown moses blog and then from 2014 with bellingcat but it's only been really the last year that we've had enough money where i can feel that we aren't gonna we're sustainable and i was like literally using my overdraft to pay the bills of bellingcat with director's loans because you know we really had very little money and um if we're like that, then I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other organizations who want to do this kind of work who will be in the same position. And if you start putting a price tag on that, you're immediately reducing the amount of people who can do it. And for mm. Bellingcat, it's about building a broad community in a whole range of you know different kind of audiences and kind of types of um, professional organizations from you know even quite young ages to you know senior and experienced people and making that part of a network. And if you start putting a price tag on it, you'll exclude people immediately. And that is kind of against what we're trying to do as Bell and Cat. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, we've got to touch on on the name. Obviously, you've explained Brown Moses and, and how that came about. Um, we've had a few questions about um, where the name Bellingcat comes from. So do you want to sort of explain that one? <laughs> So I'm very crap when it comes up to thinking clever names. So when I was thinking about it, so back in like January 2014, I was thinking I need to kind of come up with, a, I want to do a new website, but I need a good name for it. Um, and I was thinking I'll call it the open source or, and then that was taken and terrible. And I just came up with a series of really terrible names that had already been registered. Um, so I 
called up a friend of mine, uh, Peter Dukes, who he's currently running the Byline Times, but he got to new- know me because one of the first things I actually wrote about on the Brown Moses blog was the UK phone hacking scandal. Mm. Um, and he had got to know me through that because that was a t- thing he'd been working on. And he was a playwright. So I thought, I know, I'll, I'll ask. He's creative. I'll ask him. And his first <laughs> suggesting was, what about belling the cat? And he explained to me it was about, you know, this group of mice who are very afraid of a large cat. So they come up with the idea of putting a bell around its neck to warn them. But then they realize they don't actually have a plan to bell the cat. So mm. I went, I thought that's actually quite good. And I, I'm too lazy to think of another, <laughs> discuss this any further. So I went to, um, like, looked up on, like, GoDaddy, bellingthecats.com, and it'd been already domain parked for, like, $4,000. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know, I'll do Belling Cat, and it was $40. So I thought, that'll do, and I registered to Belling Cat under that name. <laughs> Just as you mentioned belling the cat, my cat burst into the room. I don't know if she heard you talking about it. She's been attacked her, but, by mice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she might well have been. <laughs> Um, we've got a question here from Igor, who may or may not have been the person uh, responsible for our uh, our slight interruption <laughs> of, uh, of service there. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, Igor asks, um, what do you think about the current situation with Navalny? Um, do you think he's going to survive his current situation? And, and will you work with him again? Um I think I I generally think there's a good chance he could die in prison, especially, you know, based on how bad his health is getting at the moment. I mean, it's Mm. it's hard to be sure 100 percent exactly what his health issues are. But, you know, this report, he's got two herniated discs. He might have been exposed to TB. Um, The last report I saw was he was, you know, was losing sensation in his hands and legs. It's always hard to know exactly what's true and what's not, because there's obviously on both sides, there's kind of information being released that can't be verified. But um, I have a massive amount of concern for him. I mean, they've tried to kill him on more than one occasion. Mm. I mean, there was, of course, the poisoning that we know all know about in August. There was a t- another attempt to appear in July where his wife was uh, exposed to um, something. And we think there's been ones previous to that. So, I mean, the Russian state want, wants him dead. Um, and I, I, for me, I think a lot of it comes down to um, a really flaccid reaction to this stuff from kind of Western states because – there's a reaction, but it's always like, we'll do some sanctions that Russia doesn't care about, and we'll do some mm. get rid of some diplomats that Russia doesn't care about. And they're willing to pay this price. And, you know, this Navalny case, you know, that's led us to discovering, um, I think we're now up to eight or nine assassinations by this same FSB team. And they've been going on for years, and we're pretty sure it's a lot more than that because these guys travel around a lot, and not all of their mm. targets are high-profile figures. And we do keep on discovering more of these murders. And keep in mind that Russia, I have spoken to, um, you know, we get accused by Russia all the time of being working for the CIA or MI6. And you might think, oh, well, that's just Russian propaganda. They don't actually believe that. But I'm hearing more and more um, tales from people we know who work for places like the UN and other big bodies who speak to Russian officials who will... When Balancat is raised up, they'll say, oh, they're MI6, and seriously believe that. Mm. So when we're exposing all these Russian spy operations, Russia is looking at this, and they're probably thinking, well, MI6 is exposing all these spy operations. Surely the Western governments want us to stop. But then they see the Western governments doing these really lame sanctions, and they must think, well, the Western governments must be okay with it because MI6 is public. Maybe we can keep on doing it and getting away with it. And um, that really concerns me because it puts everyone at risk who's involved. It puts you know Navani at risk, other opposition figures at risk. It puts people abroad at risk. It puts Bellingcat staff at risk. Um, so this really flaccid reaction to you know a nerve agent based assassination campaign is putting people at risk. And I'm not saying we should bomb Russia or anything like that, but there needs to be a price that the you know Putin is unwilling to pay that will stop him from doing you know his you know because. It, we can't imagine that Putin is not aware of what's being done because these are, you know, a secret nerve agent program being used repeatedly to poison opposition figures. Um, and I, I think there needs to be more of a serious, you know, I, I'm talking more about pulling out of Nord Stream 2 and sanctioning his inner circle in, in a really strict way, not like bombing Russia or doing yeah, sanctions yeah. or anything like that. But there needs to be more of a price than just kicking out diplomats because that is factored into the cost of anything that Russia does. Russia doesn't care about that that's just the price of doing business for them and if there's nothing more than that when all their assassinations are being revealed to the public then they're going to consider that as being you know thumbs up from the west to keep on doing it yeah and and actually as a as a similar a question in a similar kind of area and it, it, it touches on 
um, the incompetence uh, that you sort of point out throughout your presentation, the incompetence of Hyde in the tracks, the incompetence throughout of, uh, of, of the people uh, involved in these assassinations. Um, is it really incompetence on the part of the killers that allows these seeming obvious gaffes, <laughs> essentially, in, uh, to happen? Or do you think they're trying to sort of send a message with the sloppiness to say, we don't actually care <laughs> whether you find out or not? The thing is, we only see it as sloppy because they've got caught. But it's like mm. with the FSB team. They've been killing loads of people, trying to kill loads of people with nerve agents for at least several years and maybe even longer. And they've got away with it. So why would they change up what they're doing if they get away with it all the time? Um, you know, maybe the Scriffles is a, you, you know, we ha we know the Scripple case, but we didn't know about the Bulgaria poisoning. So they, the same team had already gotten away with at least one other poisoning using a nerve agent that made no impact in the international community or even, you know, the Bulgarian authorities even dismissed it. So the idea that they are doing this to send a single signal or they are particularly incompetent is, I think, almost an illusion based on our lack mm. of understanding of the scale of these poisonings. And I think as we look more and more at these poisonings, we realize they've got, been getting away, you know, with literally getting away with murder yeah, for yeah. years. So why would they change up how they're operating if it's worked in, you know, previous cases? And I, I think that is kind of, you know, a quite a broad misconception of, you know, what these actual, you know, perception of what these these um, events actually are because they're only seen as kind of you know most people can know about the Navani poisoning poisoning and the scripple poisoning but all the other ones i've shown in this presentation most people probably wouldn't really know about unless they were really engaged with this topic and that means that russia thinks they can keep getting away with doing the same thing again and again because they never have been caught before how that will change things in the future is difficult to know but again it comes back to the how the west will kind of react to these assassinations yeah, I guess people's perception of the the, the incompetence. I, I guess maybe some of that, in part, is to do with, in the case of the Scripple uh, poisoning, the uh, assassins coming out and saying, you know, they were only here to visit Salisbury Cathedral, yeah. and, which itself seems a, a, a ludicrous alibi. That seems like it's not even an alibi you expect people to believe. Do you have any opinions on on that? Yeah, I mean, it's the thing is, Russia does a lot of stuff that seems really dumb, but it only seems dumb when it's kind of pointed out, like. I, I've done a lot of work on topics where Russia has been involved, like chemical weapon use in Syria, MH17, and they lie continually. And not only do they mm. lie, but they steal ideas off the internet, conspiracy theories, and use them in official statements and you know official work. And they basically just get away with it. So why would they do anything else? Mm. No one's punishing them for you know lying about chemical weapons attacks in Syria or lying about the script wars or having these two idiots turn up. There's no real punishment for that. Yeah, sure, diplomats get kicked out. It might be a di some of them, you know, might have been intelligence officers, but you know, Putin's still got his giant palace that he's building, and you know, the, all this stuff is still happening in Russia. So it doesn't have a real negative impact on the people who matter in Russia, which is Putin and his inner circle. Mm. Everyone else, you know, they don't really care about. Sure, some diplomat loses his job, but they don't care. They've got a <laughs> golden throne to sit on. Yeah, they've got loads more diplomats where they came from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, if we move away from Russia for a moment, we've got a, qu a question from uh, Skeptical Gumby who uh, asks, um, could you give a bit more information about how you use the open source data methods during the Arab Spring? I know that was kind of the birth of mm -hmm. Bellingcat. So could you talk about that uh, a little? Yeah. So um, for me, it really started um, in 2011. Um, it was not a noble pursuit. I was basically arguing with people on the internet. So I used to spend a lot of time on the Something Awful forums and um, the Guardian Middle East Live blog commenting on it. And yeah. um, I would just like argue with people on the comments about the videos that are coming out. And there's a lot of people kind of like saying, oh, well, you can't trust this video coming from the Libyan rebels because it's fake and, you know, stuff like that. And there was actually no one really trying to verify these videos. And I found that rather frustrating. And I realized you could use... Um, satellite imagery to geolocate these videos coming from Libya, and I basically used it to win arguments on the internet. <laughs> um, but then I just then it started getting a bit more recognition from kind of you know like Guardian journalists would start qu quoting it in the live blog, and I, I just thought it was interesting that no one else was doing this. Mm. Then in um, early 2012, I my daughter had been born a few months earlier, and all my hobbies had gone out the window. So. <laughs> I thought I, I need a hobby I can pick up and put down. And this thing I'm doing with all these videos is quite interesting. So I started a quickly blogs created blogspot kind of default blog called the Brown mm. Rose blog. 
and but then I kind of almost in a hobby set myself the task of every day I would write about a video or write about something interesting. So it'd be phone hacking, and at that point, video is coming from Syria. And very early on, I mean, my posts were not high quality; they were kind of lists of interesting videos from Syria. But then I thought. A lot of the stuff coming from Syria showed the rebels with weapons, and no one seemed to know what weapons they actually had. Mm. Did they have tanks, or did they just have small arms? So I started figuring out what these weapons were and teaching myself using online resources. You know, just the thing is, they're all are mostly weapons from the so- former Soviet Union, and there's loads of military nerds who literally like document every nut and bolt on these weapons <laughs> so even when you've got like a bomb that's blown up it's, it's got a bit of kind of writing on you know you can actually look these numbers up and figure out which part of the bomb it is and then which bomb was used so i basically just taught myself to start doing this but um in 2012 there was an event called the hula massacre where there was a village um that was you know basically attacked and there were civilians killed and it was a horrific incident and these videos were being shared online and i realized then that there were actually um social media channels usually on facebook twitter and youtube that were being used by opposition media centers armed groups and sharing them from specific locations i started creating a list that i published on um the brown roses blog of every single one of these youtube channels and it started off with a couple of dozen and ended up being close to a thousand Mm. channels and every day i just go through and subscribe to all these channels and open them and just see all the newest videos from different parts of syria and look for something interesting like every day and that led me to finding the first videos of cluster munition remains uh which i did a post about and human rights watch picked up on that i did a post on the i think it was the i was the first person to write about barrel bombs which became very notorious for the conflict in syria but i mm. think literally the first person at least in the english language to write about these barrel bombs that were being used and then it, it just kind of built from there and then in 2013 i identified all these weapons that were being smuggled um that led to me having a lot so basically up until that point only a, not many people were reading it every day it was like literally a couple of hundred and then a couple of thousand and then um when i had this 2013 story um the guardian interviewed me that led to a series of interviews with like i was, I was like at home with like one that was CNN and then Channel 4 News and then like a Croatian news channel and a German news channel. Um, like they were parking their vans with CNN outside <laughs> the street. It was like a weird experience. <laughs> and that got me more and more recognition in various communities. Like there were already journalists, basically people who are like really into the conflict in Syria, be they just ordinary people, journalists, people that work in NGOs, started to get to know about the Brown Moses blog. And then with the August 21st, 2013 sound attacks, that's where I think a lot of people got to know my work because it was a mm. huge event and i was like the only person who was looking through the videos in a really systematic way and recognized the munitions that were used in that attack as being used in previous chemical attacks um and no one else had picked up on that so i was like uniquely positioned to demonstrate that with video evidence so that kind of brought me in more of an audience and more people were citing my work and then um because seymour hirsch wrote an article for the london review of books where he basically said it was a jihadi false flag backed by turkey and i had videos of the munitions used being used by the syrian government forces you yeah. know, previously um a lot of journalists saw that and realized that the seymour hirsch story was a load of garbage and because he was like such an important pulitzer prize winning journalist i was some guy with a blog it was then framed in many people's mind as kind of new journalism versus old journalism but i've never seen our work framed as one thing versus another more of like a complementary thing to traditional forms of investigation but that again kind of boosted my profile and then that's what led to more and more people being interested in open source investigation and gave them the idea of launching Bellingcat. Right, gotcha. Um, one of the things that strikes me, you talk a lot about having to you know, systematically go through some of these videos. Videos, you talk about the munitions, but obviously we're not just talking munitions, we're talking about the use of those munitions, mm-hmm. how that plays out, the the tragedies and, and, and quite horrific images. Um, how do you and your team manage to cope with spending so much time poring over what are quite traumatic, uh, I'm, I'm sure incredibly traumatic uh, images? How do you manage to, to deal with that? Um, so vicarious trauma is like a really kind of big issue within the kind of whole open source community because a lot it did build up around kind of the you know the Arab Spring where there was a lot of violent content. Um, and it's something we do have to be really aware of. I'm, I'm, it Weirdly, in one sense, I think I was kind of protected from the worst aspects of that because when I um, – I used to have terrible anxiety. And 
being forced to go on stage and talk about our work or wanting to go on and do it, I had to push through that. And I think it actually had quite, a, and also because of the sex, success of what I was doing, it actually had quite a positive. I mean, I'm, well, sorry you, to put you through that. In, in yeah, that you, even though I was looking at this horrific content, it kind of helped. I was having this kind of on the other side, this really good psychological development in that sense, <laughs> and built by so that helped to an extent. But um, that. Even, you know, looking through, like when I was looking through the wreckage of MH17, you learn not to focus on the blood and the corpses, but what you're actually look, investigating, you know, the, where the shrapnel holes are. But even then, when you're looking at tiny details, I remember very early on, I came across, um, there were various toys in the wreckage because there were children on board. And one of the toys was a little toy rabbit called Miffy. It's like a Dutch toy rabbit. And it's exactly the same toy my daughter was given when she was do- born by um, at my sister-in-law. And that really... In a way, it's those moments where you can detach yourself from what you're seeing, but there are certain things that you can't prepare yourself for, seeing something that you have another kind of association with, and that brings you right into the moment. And that recognizing those moments, those kind of trigger points, and then stopping what you're doing and going on doing something else is a really important part of the process. I mean, there's other things you do, like if you're watching a horrifically violent video, don't do it with the sound on. When we had the conflict with uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia recently as well, there was a lot of really horrific decapitations and stuff coming from there. And we, I said like to staff who weren't used to seeing that stuff don't just do not watch it but definitely the worst video i think i've seen was the uh, christchurch live stream with the massacre there and that was like genuinely like one of the most horrific videos i've seen just because of the i think first of all it's like this first person view and it's just so callous what the person Mm -hmm. is doing so um it but it's even then i like watched like 20 seconds of that i thought i'm not i'm never going to watch this video again because i there's nothing i can really learn from this and i don't need that in so it's kind of looking at where you're kind of being very aware of your own kind of psychological well-being when you're looking through this kind of content and also creating an environment in a workplace that you can discuss these things and you recognize that this is an issue because other organizations have created an environment where you can't discuss these things and where they treat it like it's not an issue and they have felt had problems with the staff who've been working on that through you know they start having various you know addictions and abuses and different coping mechanisms to deal with this kind of content and it's the sort of thing that can also sneak up on you as well mm. uh, like andy carlin who did a lot on the arab spring he tells a story in, in his book about it where he was walking down the street and saw a piece of crushed cauliflower on the street and it triggered him because it reminded him just subconsciously of some blown out brains he had seen in a particularly horrific video so all these kind of you can get a kind of ptsd from looking at these videos as well but Fortunately, I haven't had those issues that I'm aware of, um, and we're extremely careful at Bandcamp and making sure that is something. Um, like we we ha- we're going through a consultancy at the moment with an external organisation to make sure that we have mechanisms in place to cope with this kind of stuff more um, carefully. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, it's clearly hugely important work that you do. It's, it's fascinating work that you do. I, I could honestly talk to you all all night, and I'm sure we'd have uh, questions to, to do that. But uh, I think we'll we'll bring the Q and A to a close. Everybody in the chat, uh, I'm sure, is going wild with uh, appreciation for what has been an utterly fascinating evening. Thank you so much, Elliot Higgins, for for joining us at Skeptics Pub Online. Thank you. Um, join us again next week when we'll have Harry Cliff from CERN who's going to be talking about particle physics in his talk How to Build an Apple Pie from Scratch that starts 7pm right here on Twitch uh, forward slash SITP so we'll see you for that or we'll see you in the pub or we'll see you around thank you so much for joining us everyone